welcome everyone to what I think is going to be a, a very exciting uh, NISMERC meetup. Uh, we have three really excellent speakers today on uh, what I think is also a very exciting topic, the uh, use of Bayesian statistics for drug development. Let me get my screen up. Okay. Uh, a reminder, we're using Zoom software. Uh, your audio line has been placed on mute, and that, of course, is to keep all the background noise down. Uh, but we really would like to encourage folks to have questions for the panel, and you can do that using the Q&A. We will get to all the questions at the end. So, <coughs> excuse me, if you have questions for the first or second speaker, by all means, put them in and uh, we'll address as many as we can towards the end. Uh, feel free to use the chat function to talk to either the panelists or the other attendees, but as always, please keep all your comments there civil and, and nice. Uh, just a reminder that this program is sponsored by NIST. NIST is a, uh, the National Institute of Statistical Sciences. It's a nonprofit National Research Institute for Statistics, and its primary function is to pr promote statistical research. And it does that in a number of ways, but probably the biggest ways are postdocs. Uh, it sponsors conferences and workshops, uh, independent research, and the affiliates program. And so NIS is an affiliate, so our association, uh, excuse me, Merck is an affiliate, so our association with NIS is uh, through the affiliates program, and that's how this webinar is coming to you. But to remind you of some of the other things, uh, if you tuned on a bit early, you saw advertisements for a few of NIST programs. Uh, one of the next ones coming up is the use of p-values. It's actually the third in a series of NIST webinars on a very important topic uh, to all of us, the use of p-values for decision-making. And that's coming up on May 6th uh, from 10 to noon. And you can see it's a great set of speakers, including Yua Benjamini, uh, Alicia Caraquiri, and James Hung. Uh, you can find information on all these sorts of events at the NIST website, www.nist.org. Uh, and with that, let me proceed to today's topic, uh, Bayesian statistics for drug development. Obviously, there's been a lot of discussion uh, about the use of Bayesian statistics and Bayesian ideas uh, for drug development. And as I mentioned before, we have really three excellent speakers on that topic. Uh, lastly, I'll remind you that we've had, uh, well, the slides and the recording of this meetup will be available uh, in a few days' time at the NIST website. Uh, and we have recordings and slides for really all of our uh, meetups also at the site. So with that, let's get to the agenda. Uh, first, we'll have Frank Harrell from Vanderbilt talk about fundamental advantages of Bayes in drug development. And then we'll have Amy Xia from Amgen talk about Bayesian applications for extrapolation from adult to pediatric data. And then Telba Irony from the FDA talk about the value of Bayesian approaches in the regulatory setting. And so with that, if Frank, you could start to uh, share your desktop. Let me unshare mine. Uh, and let me introduce uh, Dr. Frank Harrell. Uh, Dr. Harrell received his PhD in biostatistics from the University of North Carolina in 1979. Uh, since 2003, he has been a professor of biostatistics at Vanderbilt University School of Medicine and was the department chair uh, from 2003 to 2017. He's an expert statistical advisor for the Office of Biostatistics for FDA CEDAR. He is an associate editor for Statistics and Medicine and is a member of the Scientific Advisory Board for Science, Translational Medicine, and a member of the faculty of 1000 Medicine. He is a fellow of the American Statistical Association and winner of the association's W.J. Dixon Award for Excellence in Statistical Consulting. Uh, and he has a, a really long list of specialties, and those include development of accurate prognostic and diagnostic models, model validation, 
clinical trials, observational clinical research, cardiovascular research, technology evaluation, pharmaceutical safety, Bayesian statistics, quantifying predictive accuracy, missing data imputation, and statistical graphics and reporting. And I'll also throw in, he has an incredibly good book on uh, regression modeling and has uh, periodically given courses on it. It's a great course, one of the best courses I've ever taken. And uh, he's giving another one next month. So if you're interested in a really exciting course, uh, I really highly recommend that. And with that, uh, Frank, I turn it over to you to, for fundamentals of advantages of phase in drug development. Well, thank you very much, Dan, for the wonderful introduction. And I and also I'm very uh, honored to be part of the program today and to make this presentation. So I want to start out with uh, what I think is a big picture look. Uh, and the first thing that might take some people by surprise, but I've come to believe this pretty firmly over the last decades, is that uh, efficacy is not a hypothesis, but it's always a matter of degree. And so analyses need to be consistent with that. Um, hypothesis testing and associated thresholds have hurt science to an almost um, unmeasurable degree. And of course, I don't need to tell this audience about the p-value threshold controversy that's front and center. And so the, the real question that distinguishes Bayesian approach from uh, traditional approaches, would you rather know the chance of making an assertion of efficacy when the treatment has no effect, or would you like to know the chance that the treatment works? So Bayesian is really concerned with the latter and not the former. And a theme of this presentation that will arise over and over is that probability is a condition backwards in time or backwards in terms of information flow are not uh, directly um, actionable. So what are the problems that we're trying to solve? Well, we need a way to insert extra study information, uh, and that often is skepticism, and sometimes it's optimism if you have very trustworthy evidence from past data. The frequentist uh, paradigm is, is very rigid in the sense that it's based on alpha spending, and you have a penalty for trying to learn too much too fast. Uh, because you have a little bit of a penalty uh, because the alpha errors are cumulative, whereas the sort of errors you make in the Bayesian approach are not cumulative. And that, I think, will be clear in a bit. Um, the frequentist approach turns out to be conservative if you want to learn continuously. And we know that uh, the expected sample size for a study goes down as the number of looks increase, uh, especially in the Bayesian paradigm. Um, and, and then the frequentist approach, if you're trying to learn quickly, you have multiple looks at the data, you need to use complex adjustments to the point estimates if you stop early. This is a well-known statistical phenomenon, but you'll be amazed how seldom this is actually applied in a phase three clinical trial that stopped early. I've never actually seen a publication in the medical journal that gave the right point estimate, although I've seen publications showing that the way we do it is biased if you don't correct the estimate. Uh, so the efficacy estimate would be overstated if you stop early for efficacy. Uh, the p-value is something that in the general setting, you don't even know how to calculate it without using a circularity in the formula. Because if you're using uh, sequential looks, there's no, there's no real p-value. But because uh, the p-value is a function of your stopping rule, uh, and there's no self-contained p-value as there is in a single look uh, study. Uh, this is a really big point that I'm sure you'll hear more about from the other speakers, is that every design, especially if it has any flexibility to it, it requires a one-off frequentist adjustment. So this, those adjustments can be incredibly complex, whereas if you're doing the most complex adaptive trial in Bayes, uh, you're using the ordinary Bayes machinery with no modification whatsoever. It just works off the shelf. Uh, whether you're doing response adaptive randomization or uh, regular randomization or dropping or adding treatment arms. Uh, now we have a multiplicity mess that's really caused a lot of confusion among statisticians and non-statisticians alike. So one way to state it is, do you really believe that a comparison with treatment A and B should be discounted because you also compare treatment C with treatment D? So that, that sort of discounting really violates fundamental rules of evidence uh, 
and it's a result of uh, sampling issues uh, that I'll talk more about. P-values are not directly actionable. And so the, if you condition on there being no efficacy at all and no harm, so the effect is exactly zero, uh, you're calculating the probability of, uh, of asserting efficacy given no ex efficacy, that's the type one assertion probability. What you need is a probability of efficacy, which is a probability that the difference is in the right direction. And then one minus the probability of efficacy is the probability of inefficacy or harm. And this is the real worry for regulators. This is really the definition of regulators regret in the, in the uh, positive direction. So approving a drug that you later regret because it actually doesn't work. So one minus the posterior probability of efficacy is the probability of making that mistake. It, it cannot be calculated from type one error. Uh, P-values use backwards time or information order, which causes multiplicity problems. And I think the way to clarify this, hopefully once and for all, is to start putting the word sampling in front of the word multiplicity. And so uh, most people, when they think of multiplicity, they think about multiple hypotheses. Um, and that is a form of multiplicity in the frequentist world. They also think about multiple looks at the data for one hypothesis. And that one in particular is really what should be called sampling multiplicity. And it arises because of sampling. It doesn't arise because of multiple hypotheses or multiple parameters in a model. Uh, so we need to account for uncertainties. We need to use the right amount of skepticism or optimism uh, and put that into the logic flow. And only Bayes has a calculus for doing that. Using relevant prior information, and if you're not sure, uh, you can put in the probability of relevance, which is what uh, is a very active area of research at FDA for pediatric studies. Um, and Amy will be talking about a, a related issue. Uh, if you're unsure of relevance, uh, you can be skeptical about efficacy, unless you really, really trust experts, which I usually don't. Uh, you want to use data efficiently, compute the right probabilities and in interval estimates interval estimates, and then speaking in the broadest general, generality, optimum decision making under uncertainty is best done with probabilistic thinking. The best book on that I've ever seen is Nate Silver's book, The Signal and the Noise. Uh, so the frequentist is the probability of data given an assertion is true, and the Bayesian is the probability of an assertion is true given the data. And the type one error is a probability of making an assertion of efficacy over the long run of replicate studies, except where the treatment has exactly zero effect and doesn't do any harm. Uh, the Bayesian posterior probability is a probability of the treatment moving in the right direction in terms of the underlying data generating process. And the one minus the posterior probability is a probability of no effect or harm, as we already discussed. So, we have these issues that have arisen uh, over and over. The absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. One of the greatest misinterpretations of p-value, which you will see in almost every issue of the New England Journal of Medicine, and I've pointed this out to the journal uh, dozens of times, and they're immune to this discussion. Uh, so you'll see paper after paper where a p-value is 0.04, and the authors will conclude that treatment didn't work. That's exactly what a p-value does not mean. Uh, whereas the Bayesian approach would say, under the prior, the data, and the model, the probability that B is, is worse than A, uh, or say B is better than A, and mean systolic blood pressure is 0.67. Uh, and um, the probability that A and B are similar to within plus or minus three millimeters of mercury is 0.53. So you have all these statements, and it, they apply equally whether it's so-called positive or negative because Bayes is the paradigm where you can bring evidence in favor of something as well as against something, whereas frequentist is always only against something, like the null hypothesis. In a positive study, uh, a Bayesian conclusion might be under a certain prior and data model, uh, treatment B probably reduces blood pressure. And after probability, probably you have the actual posterior probability. So I'm suggesting this is a natural English way to state uncertainty and to state what Bayes is doing. Treatment B probably lowers blood pressure, and the probability that it lowers it by some significant amount is going to be less than that, but we keep the probabilities in the, in the sentences that we use to describe the main results. Uh, 
So I want to turn back to actionability. So what is non-actionable is sensitivity and specificity. Uh, that tells you in a very limited way about test characteristics, although it secretly has a lot to do with patient characteristics. Uh, so that's not actionable because once you know the test, you already know it's positive or negative. What's actionable is the probability the patient has a disease, and that's what Bayes is trying to do with efficacy. So you have all of these advantages calculating things on an actionable scale. You're using only the most basic laws of probability. There's no sample space. There's no um, limit theorems, anything like that. It has a lot of flexibility, and it doesn't require these controversial, very, very, very arbitrary adjustments for multiplicity. It doesn't need to customize for sequential or adaptive designs. Non-inferiority is just another posterior probability, and then you have the math for bringing in external information. Um, so it operates in a forward predictive mode, and uh, Telba is really an expert on uh, decision theory in Bayes, and if you really had a utility function, you can use Bayes to give you an optimum decision. But usually the utilities are not known, and so we want to use the inputs that go into the into the decision, and they're always predictive probabilities. They're always forward predictive mode. So we want a posterior probability of efficacy, and that's something you would uh, integrate with the utility function to give an optimum decision, but we'll often stop with the posterior probability. And this is one of the most important take home messages of my talk, is you're quantifying evidence for all possible magnitudes of efficacy. So if you just burn this image, into your brain. This is the kind of image you don't see in a frequentist clinical trial at all. Uh, and so what you have here is an effect size, starting with a risk ratio of one, uh, so where there's, there's no effect of uh, mortality reduction uh, by the treatment arm. And uh, this is under two different prior distributions. As your effect gets bigger, the probability of having an effect bigger than that has to shrink. So as, as this effect size gets more and more impressive, this probability will go down. But what is the probability of efficacy as a function of what you mean by efficacy? So this is the probability of any efficacy, that it's like 0.958 or something. And this is the probability that you have at least a 20% reduction in risk and um, at least a 30% reduction in risk and so on. So you have the probability of uh, have in having all possible uh, levels of success with the treatment. It's a continuous curve. And this is really something that clinicians like uh, because you can get everything you need out of this curve. So, and we don't really need a hypothesis. And so we need uh, certain probabilities. And um, these are just examples of the kinds of probabilities we'll be calculating, the probability of any efficacy, the probability of efficacy greater than some minimally clinically important difference, probability of non-inferiority. And this is really, in a nutshell, why Bates is so flexible. Uh, because if you want to do continual learning, and let's say you did an assessment of efficacy on November 2nd, uh, that interpretation is completely unaffected by the fact that you assessed efficacy on November 1st. So if you think about that, you know, in the frequentist world, you're talking about more sample space opportunities um, and your type one error is gonna go up because of this. But when you're having uh, forward probabilities in, in, they're forward in time. And so a probability that's calculated later supersedes all probabilities calculated earlier. This probability is completely and utterly irrelevant once November 2nd rolls around and that's why there's no, there's no method in the Bayesian world to do a multiplicity adjustment for having looked multiple times. There's no, there's no formula that allows you to do it because there's no need for doing it. It's strictly a replacement probability for an obsolete probability. And then you can have a lot of flexibility. So imagine you're doing a migraine headache development program and you have four efficacy targets, you could say, well, success is gonna be hitting any two of the four. And I don't have to pre-specify that. Or I could say any three out of the four. Uh, those would be, that would be a pretty successful treatment. And if you have lots of targets that you wanna hit, you, you could say, let's just hit the majority of the targets with a high probability without specifying which targets. Uh, 
And so this is what we've already gone through just uh, for probabilities. They define their own error probabilities. And this is not true with regard to type one error and p-values. So the probability of efficacy, if you took one minus that, you get the probability of inefficacy or harm. So that would be your, your error probability if you were to act as if the drug is effective. That's the probability of making a mistake. It's very well defined and very simple. So with the uh, backwards interpretation of probability, their backward use of uh, probability, that is actually the cause of multiplicity problems. So multiplicity is, is caused by the chances you give data to be extreme. That's why we should call it sampling multiplicity. The chances you give data to be extreme, not from the chances you give assertions to be true. And once you distinguish those two things, I think it gets a lot more clear. Being backwards means you have to take into account how the data arose instead of just interpreting the data at hand. And one reason that I became a Bayesian is I tried for years to understand group sequential testing and I never could get good at it. With Bayes, it's trivial. So there has to be a downside. So you, you replace endless arguments about p-values and multiplicity uh, with one argument, which is the choice of the prior. So choosing the prior is the price of using the full probability calculus. A forward probability cannot be calculated without starting somewhere. So the prior is a necessity for you to have predictive mode actionable probabilities and to do probabilistic thinking, just as disease risk cannot be computed uh, knowing sensitivity and specificity. You need to know the background risk. Um, Let's see, there, Steve Goodman has a lot of good thinking about evidential discipline, and he has a really wonderful way to say it. Uh, the frequentist approach is not able to pre-specify evidence presentation and interpretation. It's incredibly subjective. And so with Bayes, you, you have a lot more pre-specification than you do with frequentist world because you're pre-specifying how you're going to interpret the evidence, and you're not going to let the interpretation of the evidence uh, be tainted by other things, including uh, that the reviewer doesn't like another drug that your company developed. So it enforces an evidential discipline. Uh, in, in fully sequential trials, uh, you can have infinitely many looks and everything works exactly as advertised. And there is a blog article on my blog, fherald.com, that has the detailed simulation and it shows that the posterior probabilities are completely perfectly calibrated, no matter how often you stop, you look, or how or when you stop. And there's a more recent document, um, hbiostat.org slash project slash COVID-19, where I have a very detailed sequential COVID-19 clinical trial plan that is for optimum fast learning because we have such a fast paced uh, 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 problem in front of us now and the Bayesian sequential with unlimited data looks to me is is far and away the best way to manage this. So if you look at that document, you'll see a lot more background information and a lot of uh, Bayesian operating characteristic simulations. So I'm not really going to go through um, this example except to say that when you're when you're having multiple endpoints, you can make pro uh, probability statements that are much more rational than what we try to do with closed testing procedures. What's the probability that the systolic blood pressure is reduced by at least two millimeters of mercury and the odds ratio for death is less than one or stroke, I should say, in this example. So I have a compound probability uh, of hitting success on two endpoints this is the probability of hitting success on either of the endpoints, either the mortality reduction or stroke reduction and the blood pressure reduction. And this is also the expected number of targets you achieve. So out of two targets the study had, you have succeeded on 1.9 uh, targets, which is kind of a nice summary of the multiple endpoint problem. Uh, so there's some misconceptions about Bayes and just in the interest of time, I want to skip to the single biggest uh, hesitation to adopting Bayes uh, is type one error and misunderstandings about type one error. So the first thing that you learn when you're trying to disarm someone who never wants to change their mind about anything is you try to analyze whether their, their favorite way of thinking actually has a defect in it in that they don't understand or they misquote what they, what they actually believe themselves.
this is a great one to test statisticians on. And I've heard famous statisticians state that type one error is a probability of making a mistake and concluding the drug is efficacious. That's exactly what type one error is not. And it helps to understand it by noting that the type one error is independent of the data. It's an operating characteristic of the procedure you're going to use in analyzing the data. The probability of making a mistake is one minus the posterior probability of efficacy. So type one error never was, nor is it now, an error probability. So we need to strike the word error. It is not the probability of making an error in concluding that a drug uh, is effective. So people that don't want to use Bayes because they want to preserve type one error, uh, they really are preserving exactly the wrong error. So there's other stuff you can look at when you get the slides and uh, there's some materials you can refer to and I would urge you to go to this one that I mentioned earlier for some more recent thinking plus a whole lot of simulations in R code that explains things. So thanks so much for having me. Thank you so much, Frank. That, that was fantastic. And I, I'm sure a lot of people are really scratching their heads and really thinking about some of the provocative things you said. So uh, that's really great. Okay, so Amy, if, if you'd like to start sharing your slides, Frank, you can unshare yours and let me uh, introduce you. Uh, Amy Zia is Vice President of Biostatistics uh, Design and Innovation at AMGen. Uh, she has worked on designing, implementing, and analyzing uh, clinical trials in phase one through phase four, as well as observational studies. Uh, currently, she heads up the biostatistics and design and innovation organizations in the Center for Design and Analysis at Amgen, providing leadership and holistic vision for strategic drug development and driving innovation uh, program and study designs across Amgen's portfolio of products. Uh, Amy's uh, research interests include Bayesian and adaptive designs, safety biostatistics, uh, meta-analysis, and innovative approaches for pediatric and rare disease drug development. Uh, she currently is vice chair for the DIA Bayesian Scientific uh, Working Group. She's a ASA fellow who uh, received her PhD in biostatistics from the University of Minnesota and her medical degree from Peking University in China. Uh, so we're very glad to have you, Amy. Uh, we look forward to your presentation. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, good morning and good afternoon. Um, good evening, everybody. And uh, thanks, Dan, for the a uh, very nice introduction. Um, first, I'd like to thank Dan and Nis for kindly inviting me and also organizing um, this great um, webinar to promote Bayesian statistics for drug development. And today I'm going to talk about how to use Bayesian methods for pediatric extrapolation. And this is a joint work with my colleague, May Mo uh, at Amgen. First, I will introduce the concept of pediatric extrapolation. Then I will talk about a few recent regulatory guidelines relative to pediatric extrapolation. Then briefly talk about use of the Bayesian methods um, in this setting and uh, illustrate how to use Bayesian hierarchical models um, to do partial extrapolation with an Amgen example relative to, uh, to a drug uh, named um, Sinocalcet. Uh, if we have time, I'll give a quick overview about a novel approach to use um, PKPD data to inform a amount of a borrowing for the clinical data. And finally, I'll offer some closing remarks. So what is extrapolation? Uh, it, it is uh, when we want to extend um, information and the conclusions available from studies in one or more subgroups of the patient population. Here we refer that as a source uh, population and to make inference for another uh, subgroup of the population. Here we call target population. Uh, therefore reducing the need to generate additional information 
um, to uh, make conclusions for the target population. So pediatric extrapolation is where uh, we want to extend the information from studies in adults um, or other uh, pediatric age group to certain pediatric populations. So what's the rationale for doing this? So the goal is try to minimize exposure of children to clinical trials due to the complex ethical considerations uh, of enrolling children in clinical studies. And also we very often run into, uh, uh, we have a very limited size of the pediatric populations. So we have to deal with the real world challenges of uh, being able to recruit pediatric um, patients for studies. And ultimately we want to increase efficiency of pediatric drug development programs. So there are three types of extrapolation. Um, full extrapolation means that adult data are used directly to establish the pediatric safety or efficacy claims. And the partial extrapolation means that adult data are combined with pediatric data to make such determinations. It very often means a reduced study program in targeted population, really depending on the magnitude of the expected difference between the two populations and the degree of uncertainty. So no extrapolation means that no adult data can be used and only pediatric data are used to establish safety and efficacy claims. So there quite a few regulatory guidance uh, related to pediatric drug development released in the last few years. Um, ICHE 11 is adding an addendum on pediatric extrapolation and uh, FDA, CDRH and the CBER co-signed a guidance on pediatric extrapolation where the Bayesian methods are explicitly recommended. And in addition, FDA also has a guidance on submitting pediatric study plans in 2016 and the guidance on uh, general clinical pharmacology considerations for pediatric studies in 2014. And the EMA also published a re reflection paper in 2018 to describe a systematic and transparent parent extrapolation framework and considerations on how to establish a extrapolation plan. So here is FDA pediatric study um, decision tree from their guidance. So really FDA questions for evidence-based assumptions by asking a serious questions. Uh, is the course of the disease or the response to treatment sufficiently similar in adults and the children? And do adults and children have a sufficiently similar exposure response relationship? Or is there a PD measurement that can be used to predict efficacy in children? So by asking these questions and depending on the answers to these questions, strategies for full, uh, partial, or no extrapolation can be determined. And also the EMA reflection paper is concordant with the FDA guidance. So Bayesian methods are a natural choice for quantitatively exp extrapolating information from source to target population. Uh, this is stated in the ICH guidance, FDA CDRH CBER guidance, as well as the EMA reflection paper. Um, there are several Bayesian methods are commonly used, including Bayesian hierarchical modeling we'll talk about in our example. Also in particular, the FDA CDRH CBER guidance recommended uh, this approach as a appropriate method for extrapolation. And then there are other methods. Uh, you can use the posterior from source as the prior for target population. Uh, by inflating the variance in formulating the prior, 
or power prior and the commensurate priors. So more recently, FDA in particular CEDAR has recommended a Bayesian uh, mixture prior approach by constructing the pediatric study prior using a weighted combination of a skeptical prior, which centers at no treatment effect and the adult uh, study posterior with a weighted parameter to apply to the uh, adult uh, study data. Uh, thanks to uh, James Travis at FDA, who provided me the links for his presentation that he co-authored with Jing Jing Ye, and also a recent pediatric review of a drug called Melista, which applies this methodology. Uh, I included both references in the back of this presentation. So Dan mentioned the DIA Bayesian Scientific Working Group in his introduction. Um, there's a sub-team within that working group has been focusing on use of the Bayesian methods for pediatric drug development. We published a paper in Pharmaceutical Statistics uh, in 2017, and the Mac uh, Gamello from Lilly is the leading author. So in this paper, various Bayesian methods that I mentioned in the previous slide were discussed in detail if you're interested. Also, there's a ASA Biofarm Pediatric Working Group. Currently, it's very active. And Mark Rossman and James Travers from FDA, uh, they're leading this effort. So the next, I will talk about a specific example to illustrate the Bayesian extrapolation analysis. And uh, since Sinacalcid, it's a drug made by Amgen. It's already approved with the indication for treatment of a secondary hyperparathyroidism in adult patients with uh, chronic kidney disease receiving dialysis. And this disease is characterized by a elevated blood level of a biomarker called IPTH, impact parathyroid hormone. So sinacalcid, it's an agent which acts on the calcium sensing receptor and reduces IPTH. So for this drug, we wanted to um, seek pediatric labeling in the same indication as adults. So this is both a pediatric and an orphan drug indication. Um, a observational study showed that in 2015, there were only less than 1,000 pediatric patients on dialysis who developed secondary HPT. So conducting a large studies um, in this population is not feasible. And the qualitatively, the rationale for extrapolation on the efficacy of this drug uh, gathered from adult um, uh, to pediatrics, it's examined very carefully and justifies based on those uh, guidance document. So first, the pediatric disease population is similar to that for adults. The pathophysiology uh, and the courses of the disease process um, are similar, and the outcome is likely to be comparable. And finally, P PK modeling of the pediatric data also show that they are very similar to the adult data. So in this case, um, we considered using partial extrapolation as a strategy by combining both adult and the PG, uh, pediatric data. Uh, we considered two pediatric populations. In the older age group from six to 17 years old, um, we have a, a RCT, uh, but the sample size is a small, so we hope to use adult data to improve the precision of the treatment effect estimates. And for younger age, uh, we mean uh, less than six years old. Uh, the rationale for doing the study is actually for safety, not efficacy. So we run a single arm study uh, without control arm. 
uh, in this study. So the relative uh, treatment effect cannot be established directly. And per the agreement with the regulatory agencies, um, efficacy should be extrapolated from information gathered from adults and the older uh, PEDS populations. So as a supportive analysis, Bayesian hierarchical modeling was used as the primary statistical method in this partial extrapolating um, uh, extrapolation setting. And we also used two other Bayesian methods as the sensitivity analysis, and the results are pretty robust. So here we use three level hierarchical models as our statistical model for partial extrapolation. Uh, the primary endpoint is the pro proportion of subject who achieved at least a 30% reduction from baseline in mean PTH. So in this program, we have a three adult studies, all of them are RCTs and one RCT for kids with age 6 uh, to 17, and one single arm study with um, uh, younger kids, uh, that means from day 28 to uh, six years old. So the model assumes exchangeability at each of the three hierarchical levels. Um, at level one, we assume subjects within a study are exchangeable, and the level two studies within a patient population are exchangeable. And at level three, patient populations are exchangeable. Um, so you may question about what is the, uh, what uh, exchangeability means. So per the FDA 2016 guidance, uh, they said exchangeability means there's nothing known at uh, a priori that would imply one would be better to worse, uh, better or worse in the outcome of interest than another. So here at the all three levels at the subject study or population level. So that seemed a reasonable assumption here. So you may also ask, uh, you know, how, how about uh, how we can prevent too much borrowing because adult sample size is much greater than the pediatric sample size. So we use uh, effective sample size, um, again, recommended in the FDA guidance, uh, really to restrict um, effective sample size that does not exceed um, the observed sample size in the pediatric study population. So here are the data in the program. Um, the, uh, in the pediatric population, uh, so the response rate in the study 208, this is for the older uh, kid population response rate is 55% in the treatment arm and the control rate is 19%. Uh, study uh, 100, it's a single arm study for younger kids. It only uh, enrolled the seven subjects and the response rate is 100%. For the three adult study with total sample size over 1100, the response rate in treatment arms ranges from 59 to 68% and the range is uh, nine to 10% in the control arms. So the next slides actually describe the details of the three-level Bayesian hierarchical uh, logistic regression model. So the model is actually pretty straightforward uh, in the interest of time. I won't go through the details, but I will share my slides so you can look at these details uh, if interested. So this is slide to show the results with and without uh, extrapolation. Um, through the modeling, we can show the median uh, treatment effect differences estimate uh, in the middle column and the corresponding 95% Bayesian credible sets. Uh, like uh, Professor Harrell said, one of the Bayesian um, advantage of the Bayesian methods is that we can calculate the direct probability of the true treatment effects under different scales or with different claims. Uh, 
Here on the right hand side, you can see we can also calculate the posterior probability of treatment effect greater than zero, 10%, 20%, and 30%. So you can see without extrapolation, the median treatment effect difference is 52%, uh, 53%. And the probability of a delta greater than zero is 92%. Uh, with extrapolation for the overall children uh, population, the mean treatment effect is 49%. Uh, probability of delta greater than zero is 97%. For the younger kids group, um, the median difference is 72% and the probability of delta greater than zero is 99%. So it's pretty convincing uh, there's a treatment effect. So I will use the next uh, couple of minutes to talk about a recent uh, co uh, collaboration with Cynthia Basu, uh, Xiao Ye Ma, Brett Carlin, and a few others. So the basic idea here is uh, to use PKPD data to inform amount of a borrowing for clinical data. This paper is submitted to a statistical journal and currently it's under the peer review. As we discussed, PKPD similarity between adults and the children populations, it's a fundamental principle for extrapolation. And in drug development, we often conduct extensive multiple studies to understand the drug's PKPD properties. The rich PKPD data can be utilized to quantify the degree of similarity between adults and children, which can further inform the de degree of a borrowing in the clinical data. So here is the diagram to show the concept of a PD, PKPD informed borrowing. Um, first, we'll have uh, PKPD data for both adults and the children studies. Then we fit the usual compartment PK model and then the PD model. Then we define two models. Uh, full model means that we define um, adult and children parameters uh, separately. And for the null model, uh, we set uh, adult and children parameters, we set them identical. So by comparing the full and the null models, we can generate a measure of this, uh, this similarity of the uh, adult and children groups in the forms of a p-value. Uh, this could be derived from a likelihood ratio test for goodness of fit. Then some scale multiple of the p-value may be used as a sensible power uh, parameter in a power prior model, for example, for the clinical data. So in conclusion, um, approaches for pediatric drug developments needs to be efficient and flexible while maintaining the same evidentiary uh, standards. Pediatric extrapolation requires a combination of qualitative and quantitative evidence to support regulatory approval for new pediatric labeling. And justifications for extrapolation needs to be carefully examined. That needs collaborative, uh, collaboration with PKPD scientists and the clinical teams. The use of statistical extrapolation to support pediatric trials, it's an emerging tool, and the Bayesian extrapolation helps with the sample size limitations and the missing control arms in pediatric settings. And sensitivities uh, analysis using different methods could be helpful, and the further work on leveraging data from other sources, such as PKPD data, to inform the borrowing in the clinical data will be helpful. And we need more experience and the case studies in the future. So here are all the references I used in my presentation. And with that, I'll stop here. And uh, thank you very much. Uh, th thank you so, so much, Amy. That, that was really a great example of 
the use of Bayesian ideas in practice in a, what appears to be a fantastic study. So thank you much for sharing that. Okay, so uh, if you would uh, unshare your desktop and, and Telba, if you would start sharing yours. Uh, we're very glad to have uh, Dr. Telba Irony, who is a deputy director of biostatistics and epidemiology at FDA's Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research. She earned her PhD in industrial engineering and operations research from the University of California, Berkeley. She is a fellow of the American Statistical Association. And in 2014, she won the Excellence in Analytic Science Award of the FDA for spearheading innovative regulatory science studies, uh, culminating in the, excuse me, in the release of novel uh, guidance documents, uh, which support complex decision policy making and uh, changing really the submission review paradigm. Uh, so she's a, a mover and a shaker with lots of great ideas, and she's long been a proponent of uh, Bayesian statistics. So with that, uh, Dr. Irony, the value of Bayesian approaches in the regulatory setting. So can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so thank you for inviting me uh, for this uh, uh, meetup. It's a pleasure to share the presentations with Frank Harrow and Amy Shia. And today I'm going to talk about the value of Bayesian approaches in the regulatory setting. Uh, this uh, talk is based on my experience at the FDA, both uh, with medical devices and also uh, at the Center for Biologics. Okay, so, so tell about, we're, we're not seeing your slides, so if you could try to share again, that would be great. Oh, just a second. I, I think I shared too early, so let's see. Can you see them now? Uh, I can't see them yet. Okay. Huh. Uh, this is looking better. Okay, good. All right. There we go. So if you just maximize them, we're in good shape. I'll do that. Okay. So what I'm going to talk now is I'm going to give an idea about the use of Bayesian approaches in the regulatory setting. I'm going to talk about the le lessons learned, the opportunities, and I'm going to join Frank and talk a little bit about the value of Bayes in the regulatory setting. So uh, as I'm talking, I have these numbers and these numbers uh, are references with the examples. In the interest of time, I'm going to just briefly talk about the examples, but uh, you know, they all listed under these numbers at the end in the uh, references. So first I'm going to talk about the prior information in the regulatory setting that it's very good to increase the power and the precision of clinical trials. It usually reduces the size and duration of the trials and is used to synthesize and express the totality of prior evidence. Uh, and in regulatory setting, uh, you know, the common sources of prior information are in phase two trials uh, used to uh, power phase three trials, adult prior extrapolated to pediatric, as Amy just uh, referred to. We use safety data for different indications of the same drug. Uh, we use information on the same control group used in other trials. We use natural history studies uh, to augment control groups can use prior information from other clinical trials, have to use information and subgroups from different trials. So for instance, you have uh, you know, a subgroup in a trial that uh, is, uh, uh, yielded different results. You might want to conduct a trial only with that subgroup. Uh, 
and then you can use the information from other trials. And an exciting area is the trials derived from pharmacological, like PKPD uh, models, or engineering models in cases of medical devices. And as I said before, these numbers are examples where uh, of submissions or literature in which these uh, uh, types of priors were used. So what are the important considerations when you use uh, prior information in the re regular, uh, regulatory setting? So as Fred mentioned, there is a lot of skepticism about the use of prior information. It's a very controversial uh, matter because it's mainly subjective. Even if uh, the prior is coming from a different clinical trial or is a numerical prior, you know, we want to know how much to discount. So I've seen in the regulatory setting a uh, direct discount. For instance, Amy uh, just presented in the uh, pediatric extrapolation, you can talk about what's going to be the maximum effective sample size and you might want to make sure that the effective sample size of the prior doesn't exceed the actual sample size of the trial, you can use a direct discount, you know, people like 50% just because five is a, a nice number, or use power priors, you can increase the stringency of the success criteria, or you can increase the sample size of the pivotal trial. And people also, sorry, uh, people also use a dynamic discount for priors. So discount may be based on the similarity between the prior data and the current data. And one uh, usual uh, way to do that is to use Bayesian hierarchical models in which the borrowing increases as the variability among studies in decreases and the new study sample size increases as the borrowing decreases. So it's a dynamic uh, discount. In other words, it connected to uh, interim analysis. And these uh, hierarchical models are, have been very important for uh, instance, when you do a medical devices trial in which you borrow strain across different sites. Uh, in many situations, drugs, but more importantly in devices, there is a large variability across sites. In medical devices, this variability comes from the fact that implantation of clinical device, medical devices, depends heavily on um, surgeon abilities. So in some centers, su surgeons are more, have more expertise than others, so there is a lot of variability and uh, Bayesian hierarchical models is a very good tool to borrow strength across sites instead of just pulling the information among the sites. Now, it's a, uh, another way to use Bayesian in the regulatory setting is by uh, Bayesian adaptive designs, that it can reduce the size of a trial and you reach a faster decision, or it can increase the size of a trial when, uh, you know, as a trial goes on, you see that you didn't have enough power to start with. Um, for instance, if the effect size is a little smaller than was thought uh, at the design of the trial. So you can use uh, interim analysis to decide to stop or to rec uh, continue recruiting based on predictive distributions. And in that case, the sample size is decided and optimized during the trial. And uh, Excellent use of adaptive designs is when it's used combined with modeling on, uh, in a case that results at early follow-ups, for instance, uh, can predict the final follow-up results. So the model is refined as interim looks based on the results uh, from follow-up uh, uh, that patients that are recruited earlier. For instance, some patients 
uh, and the interim result will have uh, results at 12 months and 18 months and at 24 months, some patients will have only results at 12 months. Uh, so you can predict the results at 24 months for the patients that only have uh, 12 months. And this kind of modeling helps a lot to increase the power of this uh, Bayesian adaptive designs. You can always use adaptive randomization that's becoming more popular recently. And that uh, refers to the designs where the probability of assignment to treatment depends on data obtained up to now. And that may be ethically appealing if it allocates more patients to the best treatment. So an example of an adaptive design with model, you know, the reference is uh, uh, item nine at the end of the slides. But if you have, as I said, the treatment versus control at 24 months and you have follow-ups at 6, 12, 18, and 24 months, you can have interim looks for sample size adaptation, for effectiveness, and for futility. And if you use a model uh, in which earlier visits are used to predict the final follow-up time at 24 months, you know, uh, the effective and the efficiency of this uh, adaptive design is amazing. And of course, you can have constant or variant accrual, accrual rate. You don't want to accrue too many patients at the beginning to let uh, you make decisions about sample size adaptation as you gather uh, data for 24 months and uh, later follow-ups, like 18 months. So important considerations on this type of uh, design. It increases the probability of trial success. It achieves almost optimal sample size. And it's very advantageous when there is no prior information, or in other words, when a, a flat prior, non-informative prior is used, but it's crucial when using uh, prior information, particular uh, hierarchical models, because at that, when that prior information is used, the amount of strain to be borrowed is uncertain. And then if you, use a fixed sample size, in that case, without adaptations, you can uh, either fail for lack of power or get a trial that's too large uh, when you don't need it. Important considerations, you have stopping early when you have surprises, either when this treatment is better than uh, earlier thought or if the treatment is worse of earlier predicted and then you stop for futility. If the sample variability is smaller than predicted, you stop early or in, if the Bayesian models makes good predictions. You usually do simulations to assess operating characteristics of the style design, like Frank doesn't like it, uh, but it, sometimes the FDA likes to see uh, these operating characteristics. And uh, particularly when you use modeling, there are no mathematical formulas for the Bayesian adaptive design. So you really need to do, to conduct simulations. So you simulate the trials uh, several times and you uh, use the simulations to tell you how often does it get the right answer and how often does it lead to erroneous conclusions. It helps you estimate error probability. It increases trial predictability. You can estimate the expected sample size, the trial duration, the cost. It can help you optimize uh, clinical trial design features, including sometimes it's possible the accrual rate. So you don't accrue patients, uh, subjects for the trial too fast or too slow. You can prepare and budget for different scenarios, and it's usually readily understood by the clinicians, and they can see what would happen uh, under uh, various scenarios and be more confident with the trial. So important uh, considerations about the simulations, they are usually conducted at the design stage, uh, 
although I think in many cases they are helpful even after the fact, if we get scenarios that we were not expecting. Uh, you can de should divide a comprehensive number of scenarios to generate data, and for that you need to work with the clinicians. You have to make assumptions to generate that data, and you can assess and control uh, error probabilities, type 1 and type 2, under several plausible scenarios and assumptions. It may be more difficult for the FDA to review, you know, it takes more time and it may take more effort to reach agreement between the FDA and the sponsor. And usually we get, actually always we want sponsor documentation, including the simulation code, and that facilitates our review. So what are the design features that you can optimize using simulations? the stopping rules for success and for futility, a number and timing of interim analysis, the prior probabilities, the hierarchical model parameters, the discount factors if you were doing uh, a direct discount, the predictive model and the assumptions, minimal sample size and maximal sample size, don't forget that for the minimal sample size, sometimes even if you don't need a large sample size for effectiveness, you might need it for safety. So you have to balance safety and effectiveness here. Uh, you can uh, this optimize randomization ratio, accrual rate, dose and treatment selection, the number of size, and the use of covariates or subgroup analysis. So another item that I think is very useful with the Bayesian approach and is not available with the frequentist approach is the predictive probabilities. That's a probability of future events given the observed data, is the probability of results for some missing patients, it helps decide when to stop a trial or when to stop recruiting for the trial, uh, and it's excellent to be used in labeling. Actually, everybody, that's what the patients want to see. What's the probability that they will have a successful outcome if they use that uh, treatment? So if you look at uh, reference nine, we have a situation in which we could use a Bayesian predictive probability in the label. And you can predict a clinical outcome for a valid surrogate, and that's what we do sometimes when we use uh, Bayesian modeling. So what are the lessons learned from uh, the regulatory sector? So the use of prior distribution and strict control of type 1 error are not compatible. If you fix the significance level at a traditional level, all prior distribution is discounted, and uh, one thing to know is that discount factors are arbitrary and difficult for clinicians to provide input on. So, uh, you know, as um, Frank mentioned, you have to pay something for using Bayesian, so you have to include the level of subjectivity, and the level of subjectivity is explicit here through the prior and through the discount factors. You know, the factors to consider for selecting the significance level should be whether or not you're dealing with the rare disease and in which you won't be able to get a very large trial, if it's an unmet medical need, if you're using decision analysis and, and uh, the significance level might be a sign of how much uncertainty are you willing to live with. And you can use patient input for, for selecting a significant level, and this is a um, reference for that. Uh, so what are the possible strategies for uh, considering a success criteria? You can use a full Bayesian approach using a posterior probability. That's probably what Frank is using in his approach for using a full uh, Bayesian trial. Uh, and the threshold for how big the posterior probability should be could be determined via a full decision analysis, and that will be a full use of the Bayesian approach. Uh, 
When you use uh, hierarchical models, uh, the hyperparameters are difficult to assess due to scarcity or clinical input. You know, in my experience, the clinicians cannot provide much input in the hyperparameters of hierarchical models. And there is a technical issue when you're using hierarchical model, but you have only two studies because it gets a little bit of lack of determination because you have uh, variability of, between two studies cannot be estimated. Adaptive based on design, it's a must when you use prior distributions because if you don't, you may uh, have a near miss. You may have missed a trial just by a little bit. And simulations are always helpful at the design stage to strategize the trial, even if you're not that worried about controlling uh, type 1 and type 2 errors. Opportunities. Borrowing information when it's difficult to recruit in for rare conditions of for pediatric studies and borrowing information when relevant data are available and hard to ignore. And that's often the case in pediatric trials, but also when you're considering safety for a drug or a device that's using for a different indication. Uh, so you have already a lot of safety information. The only thing you need to uh, accrue is new effectiveness information. So when you want to synthesize information across multiple trials, multiple programs, multiple sites, subgroups of countries, you know, uh, using prior is very important. Um, when you want to update the knowledge or make decisions as information accumulates, when you're doing safety monitoring, when you're doing cardiovascular safety trials, when you're using a Ebola trial with limited drug supply, you know, that might be the same situation for COVID-19. When you need efficient trials, when you're talking about unmet medical needs for life-threatening and severely debilitating diseases, the Bayesian approach is ideal. And when you're using modeling where early follow-up results can predict uh, later follow-up results. So uh, in summary, what's the value of the Bayesian in regulatory decision uh, making and in the regulatory setting? It gives you a tool to account for the totality of external evidence via prior information. It's very easy to interpret. The posterior probability is something that everybody can interpret. It's very different than p-values. You can use the likelihood principle to use flexible clinical trial designs. You can use modeling to build the likelihood function. The modeling that I mentioned several times in this talk cannot be used in the fre frequentist paradigm. You have to use the Bayesian uh, trials and Bayesian designs to be able to use these models. You can use the decision analysis to develop rational entrance parent decision rules. You can use rational thresholds for approval instead of always the same uh, significance level. You can use patients and physician input. Uh, the required strength of evidence can be rational determined by the medical need, by patient tolerance for risk and perspective on benefit, and for the severity and chronicity of the disease. So thank you very much. These are the references that I mentioned during the uh, talk. Here are examples, and you can uh, get the slides and uh, refer to these references. And uh, thank you so much. I think now we'll, I'm going to stop to share the screen, and we are going to the questions and answers. Thank you, Delva. That, that was fantastic. I, I think uh, you gave a great list of what, what Bayes can be used for and, and your approach to it. And I think I'm looking at the chat and the questions and people are really excited about it. So thank you so much. Great. So, so now uh, we have, I guess, about 17, 16 minutes for questions. Um, let's start, uh, <coughs> excuse me, with one for you, Frank, that actually came through in the chat. So uh, I think a lot of people are really intrigued by what you said about how you can use Bayesian ideas and clinical studies. 
Uh, one person asked about subgroup analysis. So a lot of uh, studies, you know, not only are they looking at sort of main hypothesis, but then there's a lot of subgroup analysis. Is there a Bayesian approach to that? Oh, there's a wonderful Bayesian approach for that. So great question. So the first, the first thing is to banish the word subgroup. Never, never, ever use the word subgroup because it's a really improper way to analyze data and it doesn't handle continuous variables. So I still see subgroup analysis on people aged less than 65 versus age 65. Those are misleading analyses because they're improper subgroups. So what BASE does is what we should be doing even without BASE is to have model-based differential treatment effect estimation. In other words, you have, um, you have a model that's richer and it has uh, interactions between patient characteristics that are of the dose response form. So you have a smooth relationship with age, you allow a smooth change in the differential treatment effect or heterogeneity of treatment effect, if you wanna call it that, with regard to age. And Bayes takes it a step further and there's some wonderful papers in the literature, uh, especially by um, uh, Lawrence Friedman uh, where Bayes says, well, we don't know if treatment interacts with something, so we're going to put the interaction term half in the model and half out of the model. So instead of making a dichotomous decision, uh, you would have a prior distribution for the differential treatment effect, and that prior would be skeptical towards a common treatment effect, but it would allow a rich data set to override that skepticism to estimate different treatment effects for different ages. Great, thank you so much for that response. Uh, Amy, uh, there are a number of questions uh, from, from your great presentation. <laughs> One of them asks, uh, for examples of two distinct populations, do you, do you know of any examples where this sort of uh, analysis can be done, uh, not extending pediatric, or yeah, to pediatrics from adults, but uh, looking at, for instance, from monotherapy to combination therapy, or even to another drug? Um, yes, we, in particular, we have used uh, Bayesian hierarchical models in the, uh, for example, basket trial in oncology, where we study one um, monotherapy, then plus a different uh, backbone therapies in a basket trial. So there's some inherent uh, biologic rationale why you want to do the borrowing. Uh, so that's a, a probably example I can give. Um, we use the Bayesian methods to try to increase the power and uh, reduce the sample size for each indication. Great, thank you for that response. And, and Talbot, to get to you, uh, uh, have you uh, do you know of any case studies uh, to reference for dynamic borrowing? Well, uh, Yes, uh, when, uh, for instance, you have uh, some pediatric uh, information uh, that you have to extrapolate in some cases, and I guess I have the reference noted, uh, you have adaptive designs. So you um, start with some hierarchical models and, you know, as you decide that the data in the current trial is more similar with the data uh, from the prior, you borrow more. We have examples for, for instance, orthopedic devices in which the opposite occurs. You know, you get, start with the prior and you start seeing that the current data is fairly different than uh, the prior uh, data. So if you use a hierarchical model with more than three uh, studies, you start to borrow less because you are deciding or, or uh, the model is borrowing less because it sees less similarity between the current study and the prior studies. So they, they look at the uh, orthopedic devices trials, they can see that there is one case that that happened. Okay, and, and while you're on that topic, another question that I, I believe refers to you. Is there any guidance in terms of the percentage of borrowing that could be made? An example, can I borrow 50% of the information from source population to target population? 
No, that's there is no guidance, and you know it's it's like a subjective manner matter like establishing the significance level. You know, it in, uh, depends on how clinicians and the reviewers in general will believe in the uh, prior information and how, you know, some most of the times they don't. And Frank has uh, a good uh, exercise on that in which he uses a skeptical prior and a uh, less skeptical prior. So that's another way to borrow. But of course, there is no guidance, and I don't think there will be any guidance. It's on a case-by-case -case basis. Great, thank you. Uh, Amy, this one's back for you. It says, uh, it's questioning how often is the concept of exchangeability in pediatric populations compared to adult one, mostly when the range of, uh, in the pediatric is often wide, like six to 17 years. Usually there are several differences in risk and outcomes in different diseases due to the physiological variables and organ development at young ages. So how is the exchangeability should be justified and if this is a required assumption for Bayesian extrapolation? Uh, yeah, that's a very good question. I, as I mentioned, that really is a, a combination of qualitative and the quantitative um, um, uh, justification. So really talk about two levels. So the first one at the qualitative level. So for these guidance, you actually need to think about um, the similarities between the adult and children or different age groups within uh, children population and how similar you are, right? So the guidance talk about you need to think about the uh, study population, whether they are similar and whether the endpoint is similar or whether the disease course and the pathophysiology uh, is the same. And the more importantly, there are considerable amount of uh, requirement for PKPD uh, uh, comparability or similarity. So after that, then we can talk about the statistical extrapolation at the quantitative uh, uh, level, right? So I talk about the hierarchical models and uh, uh, you justify the exchangeability. So I mentioned the guidance that you actually, there's nothing known a priori that would imply uh, one um, would be better or worse in the outcome of interest um, than another. This applies to uh, all the three levels I talk about, the subject, study, and the population. I also mentioned that we actually, the borrowing is actually quite sophisticated, right? You assume exchangeability um, of subjects within the, each study, then under the, mm -hmm. each population, you assume studies are exchangeable. That only at the highest level, you assume populations are um, uh, similar. So it's really not just a simple borrowing by pulling data mm -hmm. together, but it's actually sophisticated. So a Bayesian hierarchical model has this nice, nice feature if data showed uh, similarity, you actually borrow more. And uh, if they don't, uh, they're not similar, you borrow less. I think that's a nice uh, feature uh, of hierarchical models. With that said, uh, there are other ways, probably very elegant as well, like uh, Dr. Um, Frank Harrell mentioned, uh, this mixture of a prior has been recommended by FDA. You can have a combination of uh, skeptical prior and uh, uh, adult posterior. So really uh, put some skepticism on, well, I don't know much about uh, uh, the similarity. I want to pose some caution there. Uh, so that's, um, uh, we're also trying to use Bayesian model averaging. That's another approach to, uh, to make sure, you know, we have a, we can generate a robust results. So, when, when the assumption um, doesn't hold. So that's, hopefully that's uh, give you uh, some level of answer. Great. Yeah, that, that's, that's a great answer. Thank you. And then Frank, back to you. I, I mean, it wouldn't be a Bayesian session without somebody asking about priors, right? So, uh, you know, you talked about the, the fact that you can trade in a lot of the uh, issues and difficulties with frequentists, but you, you, you have to 
specify some sort of prior. And of course, there's a question about, you know, how can we realistically uh, elicit objective priors? Is that really a, a, a doable goal? And, you know, what is your opinion on, you know, the, the best ways to do those sorts of activities? Yeah, that's always a, a top question. And I think there's different uh, scenarios. So when you have adults that can teach you about uh, kids, especially when you are respectful of the pharmacology, as Amy talked about, uh, that's one thing. Uh, when you have a series of similar trials in adults or kids uh, that you really think are teaching you, uh, uh, they're, they're using the same endpoint, similar doses and so on, you know, then it's logical, especially if you had a really strong phase two study uh, to use that in a prior formulation for a phase three study. But in the majority of cases, we're dealing with new entities and we're dealing with unknowns. And I think just the practical answer is a little bit of skepticism goes a long way. And, and to me, what uh, companies should really embrace is that if you don't try to tilt the analysis towards uh, favoritism, uh, in a treatment and, and try to use other data that's of unknown applicability, but you used uh, skeptical priors, and there's some good, way to, good ways to form those, uh, as discussed in that COVID-19 document I referenced. Um, you can actually get something that will convince a skeptic and give you much more flexibility. For example, with a skeptical prior, you can make infinitely many looks at the data and don't feel bad about it because if you stop early, the skeptical prior will pull back the posterior mean of the treatment effect by the exactly correct amount. So you get this automatic recalibration if you stop early, uh, if you're using a skeptical prior. So you get all these benefits. Uh, and ultimately, the bottom line is you have to have a collaborative process working with regulators so that the priors are pre-specified before the data come in. Uh, and I think if you make these uh, somewhat skeptical, I think everybody will be happy because it will still be a more powerful approach than uh, a p-value driven approach. Great, thank, thank you so much. Okay, so, so we only have about four minutes left and what I'd like to do is, is get each of you to comment on, on, on the following question. I, you know, at, at, there was a time when Bayesians were thought to be sort of out in the distance somewhere, and you were either a Bayesian or you're a frequentist, and and you know the, the two didn't talk very much. Uh, but it seems to me today that there there are a lot of folks that are quite willing to use Bayesian type ideas and techniques uh, when it's appropriate, but still you know maybe believe fundamentally in their frequentist type ideas. Uh, it, there's not such so much of a dichotomy. Uh, and you know what we've seen today are great reasons why we should use Bayes, and certainly great examples of Bayes and what it's good for. But I would like ECU to just very briefly uh, address the question: As you see it, what's the biggest obstacle right now to more use of Bayes? Because clearly, from uh, you know the arguments and discussion we've had, the, there's utility. Uh, but there's also some resistance out there. So let's start with you, uh, Telba. What you know, what, what's the biggest obstacle that needs to be overcome? And then we'll go to Amy and Frank, and then we'll wrap up. Well, I think the uh, biggest obstacle is like tradition and still, uh, unbelievably, still a lack of familiarity with uh, the Bayesian approach and the lack of familiarity with the frequentist approach too. People got used to use the frequentist approach without knowing exactly what they're doing. Uh, and they believe uh, it's totally objective. Uh, whereas the Bayesians come up front and say, okay, there is a tint of uh, subjectivity here uh, when you do the prior, even if you can contrabalance that with the, uh, with the, uh, skepticism, but still people believe that they have to be objective. And, you know, they believe that using the tradition, they are doing what everybody did and they're being objective, whereas they don't know, uh, they, they are not. There is a lot of subjectivity 
in the frequentist paradigm from uh, the decision rules to uh, the um, you know the uh, modeling they are using to uh, everything but it's not explicit so that's what's happening great thank you Amy your thoughts um, just some comments. I will echo what uh, Talba said. Uh, part of the reason is to just people are used to the traditional approach. <laughs> uh, but really, I think uh, nowadays with the computational advantage, really uh, Bayesian methods are so uh, advanced, so can be applied a lot of complex problems. So with that said, I think education is very important not only for our statisticians, but on, uh, also for clinicians we work with closely. So really we need to reach out to really educate our scientific community on a lot of advantages, uh, like Frank <laughs> mentioned. And I think also simulation, uh, it's a great tool. So we, we use that a lot to develop a lot of intuitive uh, graphic inter interface to show people, uh, uh, you know, how, what are the, some of the design uh, characteristics, what is the, uh, what does that mean to the sample size and uh, how soon we can make decisions. So these are really important thing we do to, to help advance the uh, use of the Bayesian methods. Great, thank you. Frank, you get the last word. Oh, thanks. Well, I think the uh, people doing uh, drug and device and biologic research need to get past the idea that FDA is the holdup. That is strictly not the case. The holdup is conservatism at the companies. And the biggest holdup of anything is the National Institutes of Health. The uh, statistical tradition at National Institutes of Health is extremely conservative, very resistant to change. Uh, and it's really working against us because it, that influences a lot of academics and they influence other people. Um, and so, uh, but as, as Telba mentioned, uh, tradition is against us. And I think a really big issue is graduate programs in statistics are woefully inadequate. And I couldn't agree more with her statement about how people are not being taught what frequentist inference really, really means. Uh, our program at Vanderbilt decided to solve that by having a non-denominational graduate program. So it's likelihood, <laughs> Bayesian, and frequentist. And what I found is you really don't understand type one error and frequentist methods until you learn likelihood and Bayes. And, and most programs are only teaching frequentist and doing their students a huge disservice. And that's true of my alma mater at University of North Carolina, unfortunately. And then lastly, uh, as I tried to hammer home uh, the gross misunderstanding that people have of type one error. And this is, this is a problem with non-statisticians at FDA. Uh, they will say you need to preserve type one error and you ask them what, it, what does type one error mean to them? And they don't have a clue what it, what, it, what it is. And so we have to get some more education going about what type one error is and why, why we do not need to preserve type one error. Great. So, so thank you for that response. Thank you, uh, all three of you, for three great uh, presentations and, and excellent answers to questions. Uh, I certainly like to thank the attendees for the, their attention and, and the great questions they submitted. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Glenn Johnson and, and Jim Rosenberger, who uh, really did the technical parts on the Zoom, and uh, Crady Trang, excuse me, Christy Trang Stein who helps organize these things and comes up with ideas. Uh, again, thank you everyone. I hope everyone stays uh, safe and healthy in these challenging times, and we'll look forward to seeing you next time. So with that, have a good afternoon, morning, evening, whatever you are. Thank you for thank organizing, you. thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.